and we are live for episode number 10. We've made it to the double digits. Wow. Starting this one with a lot of energy. Usually I'm a little more calm. Let's calm it down. <laughs> I liked the energy. Okay. Well, then yeah. we'll keep it high. I feel like I got really good sleep last night. Yeah, last few you've nights. mentioned that a couple times, and that's how I know you really got good sleep last night. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, did you sleep really deeply last night? And you're like, no, I'm pregnant. <laughs> yeah, there's no such thing as deep sleep. <laughs> I did take a unisum. If you're pregnant, you know the beauty of a unisum. Yeah. So I slept pretty good. Nice. Being considered. Good. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Episode 10 of Lowering the Barrier. I'm Alex. And I'm Maddie. And today we are talking about why does weight regain happen and how to prevent it. I'm going to put out this early projection that this is going to be one of our most popular episodes. It's probably going to have the most listens, the most shares up there with Fat Loss 101, which was our first mm -hmm. episode. So that always has like, you know, sure. people come in, check it out. Oh, new podcast. Let's see sure. what it's about. Um, but I think this is one that a lot of people are going to re relate to. You know, they've tried a diet. They've tried... You know, whether it's keto, mm -hmm. uh, Weight Watchers, Atkins, Whole30, like any of those things, or if it's like they've tried a, a more class route of going it, maybe it's like some nutrition or workout program or whatever it is, and maybe they lost weight, maybe they lost mm -hmm. 5, 10, 20, 30, potentially even more pounds, and then they zoom out six months, a year, and it's all back and sometimes even more weight. Right. It's very common, at least in my coaching experience. That is extremely, extremely common. So this, the, the, the point of today's podcast is to make sure that if you lose weight, you never gain it back again within reason. And I'll kind of talk about the yeah. within reason, like a little bit of weight regain is pretty expected after a fat loss phase. But anyway, we'll talk about like what numbers are realistic, what is unrealistic, not unrealistic, just like what would be in the realm of like, okay, you're putting body fat back on, how mm -hmm. to stop that, etc. Before we do that, we have two things we want to talk about. First, the general intro. And then second, we're going to do movie recommendation that we recently yeah. listened to or watched. Okay, let me do the intro. If you would like to support us, please like, share, and subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. If you're like, wow, this podcast was absolutely phenomenal. I need to just tell everybody I know about it. Please do that. We would really appreciate it. And uh, one way to do that would be just screenshot and share it on your Instagram story and tag us at Alex Timmy Fitness and at Meals with Maddie. We would really appreciate that. If you want to support us financially, you are you're amazing, and we appreciate <laughs> that. We we love making money. It's yeah. one of my favorite <laughs> things in the world. And if I can do that while supporting other people with a product that I have put so much time and effort and love into, and it's a, it's a win-win trade-off. That's great. You know, yeah. I go to the store, I go to a grocery store mm -hmm. and I buy ham and bread and cheese. You know how long it would take me to make that ham, bread and cheese? Yeah. If I can buy it for a couple bucks, that's a great trade-off. That is value added on both sides of the equation. Similarly, I have spent over the last decade mm -hmm. learning about fitness and nutrition and so now I have two paid products that you can check out. And the first one is the A-Team. That is my group training program, four workouts per week, new cycle every six weeks. And there's a seven-day free trial. So try it out. Less than a dollar a day too. And then the other program I have is with Danielle, the dietitian. It is called Forward Forever. Our next cycle starts later March. March, March 24th is when registration opens. Okay. And then we start on March 30. Nope. April 1st. April 1st. I'm, yep. I'm pretty sure it's Monday. Yeah. Yep. April 1st. Okay. So cool. Yeah. If you're curious, Forward Forever has training, nutrition, education, weekly private Q&A with Danielle and I. I say private. It's with the, it's private to the Forward Forever members. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, feel free to shoot them to me on Instagram. Okay. Let's talk about the movie we recently watched. Yeah. We don't really watch too many movies. Yeah. It feels no, like. No, so, we don't. So this is a fun little Yeah. Maddie treat. for a long time has been asking to watch Wonka, the new Willy Wonka movie. Yeah. With uh, Timothy Chalamet. Yeah. I had just heard really good things about it. It wasn't something that was like really on my radar when it was first announced. I you had mentioned that you want to watch it. I would have completely passed it off. Like, eh, I'm just not interested. That's not my thing. I had seen so many good things about it. Like people yeah. were really excited about this movie <laughs> yeah and i am here to say that it's like you should watch it 
you should definitely check it out because it was way better than I anticipated. It was, it was so fun, fun. Yeah, it was a really it fun movie. It was so movie. fun. I was telling my friends like you, because they had, they had said the same thing. Alan and Nate, they had said, you know, uh, it's just not something that was on my radar. And they were like, how was it? And I said, dude, you really root for Willy Wonka. Like, yeah. So this is a spoiler free kind of like background. It takes place when Willy Wonka first came to America. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure first came to America and sure. then like started his roots into business. And like, we know Willy Wonka is this like, you know, all the past stories of this ultra successful, I'm going to say like billion or trillionaire, maybe Yeah. just unlimited sure. wealth. Mm -hmm. He's able to build anything he wants. If he dreams that he'll build it. And so this was like more of his roots, like early, mid, late teenage years kind of vibe. I don't know exactly what age, maybe early 20s even. Yeah. Somewhere around there. And uh, Timothy Chalamet was absolutely charming in the role. He crushed it as Willy Wonka. You know, you can get so attached to these different characters. Yeah. Uh, who was it? Like Gene, Gene Wilder? Was yeah, that the original? the original? And then there was the Johnny Depp. Version. And his was more like curious more like kind of eccentric kind of yeah. out there you know a little bit like kind of johnny depp's play you know that's mm -hmm. like how he but timothy chalamet was so just like i'm not gonna say necessarily relatable but he was so like charismatic yeah and fun and upbeat and positive that you really rooted for him as a main character more than i would say even most protagonists of most movies like you, you just want him yeah. to succeed and, yeah yeah so I mean, really glowing review and honestly, very deserved. It was so much fun, kind of a musical, but yeah. even if you don't like musicals, I would say that you probably still will like this one. At one point, one song came on when they were going into the, I'm not going to say where they were going sure. into, but, and I was like, this song rips. Like, and I mean that <laughs> in a positive way. It was so good. So yeah. Yeah. It's a fun soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was just a really fun movie. You know, like I have a lot of childhood nostalgia when it comes to the original mm -hmm. and the the original is my favorite i like that one better than the uh, johnny depp version so i was it was really fun to watch a like prequel versus like a remake because yeah. i actually had no idea what the movie was about when yeah. we put it on outside of it just being right in yeah. the wonka universe in the wonka universe sure. exactly yeah also the oh crap what are the the oompa loompas the characterization of them was absolutely hysterical so that is something that i would i would definitely yeah again so it gets a good it gets a great review i'd give yeah. it like a eight five or even nine out of ten that yeah. was awesome yeah, me that too. was great okay ready to get into today's episode i would love to all right so this is a number that i completely made up it's not a real statistic but <laughs> i'm gonna say very roughly Probably seven out of 10 listeners to this episode have probably tried to lose weight with a specific diet or program only to gain it back and potentially more. And so the whole purpose of this episode is to make sure that never happens again. And the way we're going to do that is we have a bunch of bullet points on like what happens when you or like why you may regain the weight and then what to do if you notice that this is happening to you to make sure that you put a halt to it and potentially even reverse that and, you know, get back to that, the, the weight that you feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I do also want to emphasize that like you can still, you don't have to pursue weight loss. You can pursue health promoting behaviors and <laughs> weight loss can be the outcome of that. Yeah. That's a great note. And, but vice versa, I don't want to shame people who do have weight loss goals Sure, because usually hopefully fingers crossed a lot of times those weight loss goals and the things that you do to achieve that weight loss is usually a health promoting behavior. Mm -hmm. Not always. Some people can go through really drastic means, do a really restrictive diet, you know, and there are unhealthy ways to go about it, but those things usually typically go hand in hand. So yep. whether you are shooting for weight loss, health, both, these things can exist in tandem. Okay. And then one more note, if you've been somebody like, let's say you're like 150 pounds, just as an example, 150 sure. pounds and you lose 10 pounds and okay, you're like 150, now you're 140, you know, number of weeks or months later. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to start eating closer to maintenance. And mm -hmm. you bump up your calories, maybe three, 500, whatever it is up to back to maintenance. And you're like, oh my God, I gained weight. Now I'm 142, 143. What's going on? Right. Am I doing something wrong? That is 
you are going to gain weight when you move. Or there will be a weight shift, a drastic weight shift when you move between any phase. If you're going from a bulk to a cut, a cut to a bulk, cut to maintenance, maintenance to bulk, maintenance to cut, etc. All of those, you know, different points or phase changes, there will always be a drastic weight shift. So just know that like if you put on two pounds when you go from a cut to maintenance, that is stomach content. Right. That is glycogen and that is water. Yeah. Like you are eating more food. So with more food, there literally comes more weight because food does weigh something. And then you'll have more glycogen, which is like muscle fuel, essentially. It's just it's energy, essentially. It's a carb storage form. How our, how our body stores carbohydrates is uh, glycogen. And then, yeah, more water. As you eat more carbs, every two to three grams of, or I'm sorry, every gram of uh, carb that we eat holds on to about two to three grams of water. So, you know, every time I say that, I kind of like a part of me feels like, dang, I shouldn't have said that. And the reason is because I'm worried that people will hear that and be like, oh, so I should eat less carbs then. Yeah. It's like, oh gosh, we're really getting in the weeds now of like yeah. this weight management. If you are somebody who's like an MMA athlete or a wrestler or bodybuilder and you need to hit a weight target, mm -hmm. sure, that like acute weight management strategy is important. If you are just like, Susan from down the street <laughs> who wants to tighten up a little bit, you don't need to worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't cut out carbs just to lose weight. Yeah. And similarly, your note about, you know, when you move between phases, I think that's also going to be really noticeable. If you have a weight loss goal and it's like 5, 10, 15 pounds, it might feel like a really drastic shift in weight as you move back to that like move into a maintenance phase from a fat loss phase because then just like the scale numbers is so much like, I don't want to say so much smaller, but you know, if you, if you gain back two or three pounds on the scale, even though it is stomach content and water content, that's going to feel like a bigger yeah. jump it's when like it's 20% of what you yeah, lost. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's also a really important thing to kind of keep in mind is. Yeah. Just expect context. it. <laughs> just expect that, you know, it's why it's why multiple data points are always a good call you know i've said this in the past but you know if you can get your weight data to you know and especially weight averages to know how like how many calories you're taking in because if you know if you're going up in weight over time you're in a surplus if you're staying the same weight over time you're at maintenance and if you're going down in weight over time you're in a deficit there's no getting around that yeah within reason maybe you lost a limb all right <laughs> You know, that's different. <laughs> yeah. And uh, similarly, I've mentioned it in the past. When you think of your ideal weight, I would think of a range yeah. of about five-ish pounds, 10-ish yeah. pounds, depending on, you know, size and whatnot. But yeah, I would I would consider a range. And I think that that kind of helps alleviate some of that like mental stress that people face. Mm -hmm. For me, it's essentially if my clothes fit, I'm, I've maintained my weight right. pretty well. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's a good call. Okay, let's get into the first reason why people could regain the weight. And then we will talk about how to make sure that doesn't happen. And again, just to reiterate the format, that is how we're going to be doing this. And we have how many bullet points we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine bullet points here. So there will be chapters. Do you think it'd be pertinent to read them all out or eh, it'd just be a lot of reading? Yeah. There'll be chapters at the bottom. So yeah. if you're curious, just skim through the chapters and see if any one of these really pertain to you and maybe listen to that section twice, because I already know you're going to listen to the whole thing once. So uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. First, rapid weight loss. So, you know, I think this happens so often. People will be like, okay, I'm going on vacation in a month or I have a wedding in a month or, you know, whatever. Not exactly one month, but doesn't yeah. matter. And so they will do drastic things. They will cut their calories extremely low. They'll be doing a shitload of cardio. And what happens here, when you lose weight very, very quickly, you will lose. So you're, anytime we lose weight, we're losing a proportion of both body fat and muscle. Let's just put those two buckets because each one of those things hold energy. So when our, when we're in a deficit, we need to pull energy from somewhere. We can't just make the energy. We need to pull it from some, from somewhere and it gets pulled from both body fat, which is stored energy and muscle, which technically does store energy as well. So the, there is very likely seemingly there was one study that looked at this, but then it's pretty old. 
but there's probably an upper limit to how much body fat we can lose per day. Like how much body, how much energy we can pull from body fat per day. So if we go above that, and this is really the reason I'm kind of like stepping on thin ice here is because one, this is not concrete. Sure. This is not like something that we have tons and tons and tons of studies where like, oh, this is the exact number that we can hit. So I'm really like kind of walking on thin ice here, just trying to be a little conservative with this, but let's just look at like the general thing that I'm saying rather than trying to nitpick every single point. Okay. So let's say we lose weight very, very quickly. I'm talking... It depends on the size of you. It depends on how much body fat you have. If you're if you're if you're lighter, you probably shouldn't lose as quickly. If you're heavier, like three hundred pounds, two hundred pounds, three hundred pounds, four hundred pounds, you can lose weight mm -hmm. a lot quicker because you have a lot more body fat. Especially if you're like three hundred plus, you probably unless you're like Hafthor Bjornsson and just like straight muscle at three hundred pounds. Which if you're listening, Hafthor, can I get your autograph? <laughs> please please shout us out on Instagram. <laughs> he, if you guys aren't familiar with who I'm talking about, it was uh, the Mountain from Game of Thrones. And if you just Google that, if you don't know who that is, type in the mountain game of Thrones and you're gonna be like, Oh, Whoa, he has the, I'm pretty sure he has or had the world deadlift record at 501 kilograms, yeah, which is like 1102, I think pounds. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. So rapid weight loss. So what happens is you're going to be losing a greater proportion of muscle than you are body fat. Well, the thing is, is the body doesn't like letting go of muscle. And it wants that back. So it'll increase hunger, which when you increase hunger, what are you going to do? You're going to eat more, right? Because <laughs> you're hungry. So you have this increased hunger. And then when you gain the weight back, you're going to be gaining a higher proportion of body fat. Okay. So on the front end, we've lost and we've lost more muscle. And on the back end, we've gained more body fat. Let's say yeah. we go from 180 to 150. <laughs> then we go from 150 to 180 the exact same weight as when we started, but our body composition would be much, much, much worse mm -hmm. if we are going with this like very aggressive rapid weight loss. However, this assumes that somebody is not eating adequate protein and lifting weights. Right. If they are doing that, those two things, protein intake and lifting weights are two, are the two most anabolic stimuli for gaining muscle, gaining and retaining muscle. If somebody were doing that, they were taking their sets close to failure. They were lifting with a structured training program that is, you know, called the A team. They were, or forward forever. They were, <laughs> you know, if you are doing that, you might be able to lose weight a little bit faster, do an aggressive diet, mm -hmm. be able to hold on to potentially even gain muscle mass, depending on the rate of loss, depending on how hard you're working, depending sure. on your protein intake, your sleep, your stress, all those things. And you might not need to worry about your rate of weight loss at all. Now, I will say, if you go with the more rapid weight loss, you may have just a rebound effect of like, holy crap, I'm really hungry. I'm sick of this. I'm throwing in the towel. So that's why when, when, when a lot of people say like, we want to shoot for sustainability, it's not that we want to sustain a calorie deficit forever because that's, yeah. that's not happening. Right. A calorie deficit by nature is... There's, there's an end point because yeah. we're not just going to die down to zero pounds. Exactly. God, we look so hot. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's just a joke. <laughs> it's just a joke. But yeah, so, you know, the way to combat this is one, potentially go a little bit slower. A good, <laughs> a, a great rate of weight loss would be half percent, one percent. I'm going to say half to one percent of body weight per week would be a really, really good target. 1% is very common per week, but it's like, if people don't sh hit that, first off, that's hard to do. You weigh 160 pounds, those are 1.6 pounds per week. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of weight. That's, that's yeah. like, it doesn't sound like it when you hear 1.6 pounds, you're like, Oh, I was really hoping to go faster. But when you conceptualize that's the probably, difference in calories, that's probably very roughly very ballpark about an 800 calorie deficit per day. Yeah. And that's that is intense. Intense. Yeah. Like, dude, if your maintenance is like 1600, you're talking, you're going to be 800 calories a day. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. It, you're not eating that much. Right. Or you're not eating that little. Right. At least not for multiple days. Dude, you'd be so hungry. And so this would, and so that's why I like saying like down to half percent per week. And ultimately there does have to be a degree of sustainability <laughs> simply because 
like you can't just lose weight for one week. I mean, you can, but sure. like, yeah, I bet that's not going to reach most people's goals. Yeah. And the other benefit is if you're going slower, when you do transition back to maintenance, you're going to have an easier time because you're already kind of used to that. Yeah, like your so diet true. will feel so similar. Yeah. So true. That you're going to just hopefully prevent that you know, weight regain because yeah. you're already used to eating right. that way, especially, you know, you're going slower, you're spending more time in a deficit. Yeah. That transition to maintenance is going to be a lot smoother. I wouldn't get too hung up on any specific rate of weight loss. Mm -hmm. I would just look at your weekly averages. So I've probably said this on a previous episode, but just in case we have any new listeners, because like I said, I think this is going to be one of our more popular episodes and I've already dropped an F-bomb, which I'm sorry for the new listeners. Um, <laughs> we did mark it as explicit though. I've just started marking every episode as yeah. explicit, just in case. Yeah, it's a good call. Yeah, but when you weigh yourself, you know, we want to get this weight data, right? This body weight data. So when you weigh yourself, do it first thing in the morning, after you wake up, after using the bathroom and before you're eating or drinking anything and with similar clothing, ideally like very little on. So I just weigh myself in my briefs. That's good enough. You know, I wouldn't weigh myself in like sweatpants and a hoodie because that would add like three, four five pounds. Mm -hmm. And then what if the next day I'm wearing a thin hoodie and you know, shorts or something like that, then it's yep. like, it's just really hard to control for. So, and then you look at the weekly average data, you know, one day you might be up, you might be 147. The next day you might be 146. The next day you might be 148 and think like, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. Maybe you just had a little more sodium. Maybe you had a little more carbs. <laughs> maybe you had a little more stomach volume, like, like fruits and veggies. So you're just weighing, you're just weighing down a little bit more, you know, foods that are high in fiber are usually pretty high volume, which is a good thing because they keep you satiated, but you know, they will increase your body weight. And so that's why it's a really good idea to look at at least three data points per week. I personally just weigh myself every day just to get into the habit of it. Right. And then you look at weekly averages. I have a free data a sheet in my link in bio on my Instagram. If you need one, it's just a Google sheet. You can just make a copy of it. And then if you just, if you prefer an app, happy scale is one or macro factor, macro factor just takes care of all this for you. It's a, it's like yeah. a nutrition coach in your pocket. Use code Alex for a two week free trial. Really, really on top of my plugs today. My yeah. goodness. Yeah. I'm, you've gotten all of them I've in the first. Them. Yeah. I don't even know. 10 home. minutes or yeah. something. <laughs> Jeez. I've been going, Oh my gosh, 23 minutes in. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, go a little bit more conservative or moderate, you know, with your calorie deficit. If you are experienced, you can go with an aggressive deficit. You know, the nice thing about an aggressive deficit, maybe we should do an episode on aggressive dieting because it's probably something that people want to hear about. Like what are the pros, yeah, cons, definitely. what are the trade-offs? And it is actually a very viable approach for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It's just not for, I would say, I, I hesitate to say it's probably not for the majority, but if you've, if you have no experience in dieting, it can be just a little bit trickier. And I yeah. broadly would not recommend it to my audience. Personally. Yeah. Yeah. It requires a lot more mental, like, I don't want to say mental strength. That's not what just, I'm, what I'm talking about, but like you will spend a lot more time thinking about yeah, you're going to become food obsessed Yeah, for, for a bit. You're going to become, you, you probably, you likely will become pretty food driven and food motivated. And yeah. And if you have other stressors or things happening and most people do, right. like if you're in a stressful job or you have kids or in, you know, just things happening, yep. it sometimes it's like, do you really want to be thinking about food in that way all the time? Yeah. But that's conversation for another day. Right. Okay. So do you actually want to add that to our topic list? Yeah. I'd love dieting? To. Thank you. Okay. Next point of why you may regain weight is similar to what I just said, and it is just not lifting weights or eating enough protein. And again, either, either side of this equation, you're going to be losing, or I'm probably going to say you're not, you're going to be losing muscle. If you're not lifting weights, you're going to be losing muscle. If you're not eating enough protein, muscle is made up of protein. And so if you're not getting enough in for your body to, you know, build uh, muscle, then yeah, you're probably going to be losing protein or uh, muscle. So a good protein target, 0 0.8 grams, maybe even down to 0 0.7, let's say 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. If you have 30 more pounds ish to lose, use goal weight instead for that calculation, you'll be in good shape. And then for lifting weights, yeah, just like you don't have to be anything crazy about this. You don't have to go live at the gym. Mm -hmm. If you lift for 30 minutes per day and you do that two to three times per week, you just do some full body compound movements, you know, multi-joint yeah. exercises, you, you know, you take your sets close to failure. You could even do supersets if you're low on time, antagonist supersets. So like do like a push and then a pull. So like a, like a dumbbell bench press followed by a dumbbell row, 
something like that, just muscle groups that aren't going to interfere with each other, you're going to be in really good shape. And that might only take you like 20, 30 minutes, two, three times a week. Mm -hmm. You do that in combination with a calorie deficit, you're going to get your best results ever and it'll be easier than ever to maintain. So eat enough protein and lift weights. That is a very quick one. I think we can just kind of, yeah, because we kind of already covered that. Yep. Our next point is not accounting for metabolic adaptation. And so we are going to do an episode very soon on metabolic adaptation. And, and it sounds so, I don't even know the right word for this, but it sounds so like out there. Like it's like, whoa, metabolic adaptation. Like yeah. It sounds so fancy, but sure. really all this means is, okay, so every, every pound of body weight that we have every bit of body weight because not specific to the pound it's not it doesn't like round to the nearest pound or anything like that but every you know all body fat adipose tissue and muscle tissue is metabolically active which just means that it is it consumes energy it requires energy to upkeep so if we are going from like 200 pounds and then we lose weight we go down to 150 pounds our basal metabolic rate will be lower. That is the energy that we expend at rest will be lower because we've lost 50 pounds. And this is the same if you lose five or 10 or 15 pounds. Now, basal metabolic rate is just one part of your total daily energy expenditure. And so like if you go from 200 pounds to 150 pounds, but at 150 pounds, you are like moving more and you just feel more, so much more energetic and you know, you're going for long WALKs. I can't say the word because my dog will get excited. Then, you know, your total daily energy expenditure may be very similar, but let's just say we're inside of a vacuum. You know, you, you're not really, you're, all movement is the exact same. You're eating very similarly, but um, in terms of like diet, dietary composition, but you go from 200 pounds to 150 pounds, your energy expenditure will be lower. And so you maintain on lower calories. And so your maintenance calories or your maintenance target from when you started the diet is going to be very different from your maintenance calories at when you end the diet. Mm -hmm. And so you have to account for that. And this is like, I don't really love reverse dieting at the end of a diet. I would just say like, get out. Yeah. Get out, get a, get, go back to your expected maintenance. But this is one potential upside of reverse dieting is like, if somebody's not sure what their maintenance is, they can just kind of like slowly creep up. Mm -hmm. I would say personally, and reverse dieting is just like an incremental increase from your, your deficit calories back up to your maintenance. Yeah. There's no magical benefits of it. There's no, there is no benefit to reverse dieting. And the downside is that you are like, it's not going to like stoke your metabolism or some shit like that. Like I fear that all the time, but yeah, you're just spending more time in a deficit, which if you're done with your deficit, get out. Yeah. So I would jump to your lower end of expected maintenance and then you can kind of see it creep up from there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anything else we want to talk about, about metabolic adaptation? I don't, I don't think so. Okay. The other kind of side of the metabolic adaptation that I guess I should cover really quick is it works on the other side of things too. As you, so not only like, I feel like I didn't cover it enough, but I don't know how much I really want to beat this one down without going into the, like the weeds it. of it. Yeah. But I feel like I should cover it a little bit more as we reduce our energy intake in terms of like calories, calories and energy basically can be interchangeable by the way. So as we reduce our calorie slash energy intake, we are probably going to expend less calories. And, and that is, that is a, in that is something that we adapted over time. That is very beneficial to our survival in times that we had less energy coming in crops didn't pull through. Sure. Yeah. We didn't get the hunt, you know, our, we will subconsciously burn less energy, less moving of the hands, less pacing around the grocery store, let just like less whistling and humming and tapping our yeah. foot. And we're not doing our dishes with the same pep in our step, you mm -hmm. know? And we might even, might even start leaning and slouching a bit more just because we don't even feel like, you know, sitting up straight. Not that sitting up straight is something that's good for your posture. And that, <laughs> uh, but again, that's another, everything I say, it's like, I, I could go down a, a rabbit hole. Right. I love this stuff. All right. Anyway. Okay. So yeah. So it works in reverse too. As you decrease your energy or your, your calorie intake, your calorie expenditure will probably come down. And then in reverse, as you increase your calorie intake, your expenditure will probably go up. And everybody's degree of metabolic adaptation is very different. That's largely based on genetics. Me, I feel like I am 
very adaptive where if I bring down my calories, my expenditure tanks and vice versa. Yeah. I mean, I'm like a freaking hummingbird when my yeah. calories go up, I cannot stop pacing around. Like I yeah. just do everything. And so being in a bulk is great for me. I actually posted uh, yesterday or two days ago of the time of recording this, a bulk update. Mm -hmm. And I shared stats uh, on how many weeks of the last like two and a half years, um, like how much time over the last two and a half years I've been in a bulk. And it is 72%. And that's actually pretty crazy to think about that. I've that's been really crazy. Yeah. I've been bulking for 72% of the last two and a half years. Like that's pretty nuts. But so somebody might see that and be like, why is he not fat? He should be really, <laughs> really fat by now. <laughs> but it's because I'm bulking at a, at a very slow rate. Definitely. Um, and, and we did actually talk about that on the how to optimize muscle growth, which was episode three. Mm -hmm. But we are going to have a bulking episode down the road too. We have that planned. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of like the metabolic adaptations, that is one of the craziest things that I witness just living with you <laughs> is <laughs> like when when he's really deep into a cut, like we always joke like he like smiles less. Yeah. He laughs less. That's not a joke. No, but we kind of like Poke point. Fun at it. Yeah, yeah. And we're not saying that most listeners or most people are getting to the point of a cut where they're maybe experiencing that. Like that typically happens when Alex gets very Disgustingly lean. Disgustingly lean. Like, so we're not, like we're, I'm not saying that to like scare you. No, that, <laughs> that, that, that you're going to be cutting. Yeah, probably won't happen for most people. <laughs> yeah. But then on the, on the flip side, you know, today, for example, <laughs> Alex has been nonstop moving. Yeah. He, since we woke up and it's, and it's not just like, oh, he can't sit still, which he already paces a lot, but it's the whistling. It's the constant, like <laughs> chasing after the dogs. It's just random things. And it's, it's really funny to witness. Yeah. Polar opposites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I think people don't put enough stock into a deficit is a stressor. Mm -hmm. Dude, you're going to be you might be a little grouchy. You might yeah. just, things are like, you know, those days when you wake up and you're just kind of like, kind of on edge. Yeah. A deficit is not going to make that better. No. A deficit might keep you like where you're just a little on edge where like something happens and you're just like, oh, dang it. You know, like, yeah. and little things, you know, I remember one time when I was deep, deep, deep into a deficit mm -hmm. and my shoelaces come untied <laughs> and I was, th I was literally thinking like, wow, this again. <laughs> Like it's, it's, it takes me two and a half seconds to tie right. my shoes, you yeah. know? So, and it's just like, it's just little things like that become yeah. a little bit more annoying. And it's you know, funny to look back yeah, on in the it moment. Is. It's like, Oh, I know. But now it's kind of like, it Oh is. my gosh. That's whatever. So Cause you just, you just start recognizing and it's like, oh, I'm just being ridiculous, but yeah. in the moment. Yeah. So my advice w f for somebody who's like feeling those kinds of, you know, you've been in a deficit for a while, just take a break. Just take a maintenance break. You know, yeah. sit at maintenance for a while. You're not going to gain any body fat at maintenance. That's the whole point of maintenance is right. like you're maintaining, you know, yeah. and you can still gain muscle and technically lose body fat mm -hmm. just so, 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 so yeah. slowly. But And if going back to maintenance seems like really scary or stressful, just decrease your deficit yeah. rate. Just increase your calories yeah. all the way back up to maintenance and yeah. just like slow it down a little bit more. Yeah. You could totally do that. Totally. But reasonable. I mean, not that you should fear maintenance. Like. Nope. Nope. But I like it. Okay. Next thing of why you may regain weight is you're seeing, I want you to handle this one actually. because uh, We're on the diet foods yep. versus maintenance foods. Yeah. 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 This is something we've definitely talked about a couple times or at least, you know, in passing or in, men, you know, mentioned when you are in a fat loss phase or you're dieting, the foods you eat should look really similar. They might not be identical, but they should look really similar to the foods that you eat in maintenance or your favorite foods. If you are in a diet or a fat loss phase and you are cutting out your favorite foods for the sake of, oh, I, I have to eat less. I have like my favorite foods are too calorie dense you are going to be doing yourself a huge disservice because you're not you're not going to know how to incorporate those foods into a diet that's sustainable in my opinion so i would say that you should be able to eat you know we'd say all foods fit so it's more so how can you make your favorite foods fit into the calorie target that you have set up you know, if your favorite food is Little Caesars pizza, maybe you're not eating half of a Little Caesars pizza every single night. But that doesn't mean you can't ever eat 
a couple slices. Do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I guess, I mean, this is kind of a side note on the Little Caesars pizza thing. I can still eat Little Caesars pizza when I'm in a deficit. Sometimes it's just, you know, one of my strategies for that is eating so slowly. Yes. So slowly. There are times if I'm deep into a cut, but I really want pizza. First off, I pre-plan that pizza. Yeah. I know I'm having two slices of pizza, maybe one breadstick or something like that. Maybe right. no breadsticks, but let's just say it's two <laughs> slices of pizza. I'll pre-plan that early on in the day and then plug in the rest of my meals around that. So yes. I know like what budget I'm working with. And then, yeah, I'm going to reiterate it. You eat so slowly. You have to just to try <laughs> to increase the amount of hunger, drink a lot of water around it too. Yeah. So, you know, implementing those hunger management strategies is one way that you can still kind of eat the same types of foods, just different sizes, but really ultimately, you know, first, yes, your food choices should look very, very similar, but just changing the portions instead of like <laughs> two servings of rice, you eat one serving of rice, but you're still having like shrimp and rice or salmon and rice or chicken and rice or whatever yeah. it is, you know, and uh, those are kind of boring meal examples, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, it could be anything. It could be instead of you could even two I sushi mean, rolls, you eat one sushi roll. Sure. Or even just like, if you love fettuccine Alfredo, yeah. you know, you just, you, you, figure out the rest of your day mm -hmm. and what foods you can incorporate throughout your day that are going to help from a satiety perspective yep. so that you're feeling really full because that is a calorie dense meal you you know your portion might be smaller but it shouldn't be that you can't eat it yeah i totally agree and then once it starts getting really hard like you're still you're still trying to enjoy your favorite foods but maybe you're just too hungry like when you do enjoy those favorite foods then yeah, it might be time for a swap. You know, one mm -hmm. of the swaps that we made when I was deep into a deficit was we didn't even necessarily swap it, but like kind of was adding cauliflower rice mm -hmm. to our white rice. And so we would kind of do this half, half mix and, you know, still get the carbs from the white rice, but then the cauliflower rice is so, so, so high volume. I think it's like one cup is 10 calories or something like that. Something crazy. It's ridiculous. So we started doing that instead of like, I would have eggs a lot of times for breakfast instead of doing like three, four eggs, I would do like one or two eggs and then like 100, 200, 300 grams of egg whites to help, mm -hmm. you know, egg whites are so freaking lean and high volume. So it's just like making smart changes like that mm -hmm. instead of the high calorie tortillas, like which, which is just a standard tortilla, you the low carb tortillas, which are shockingly lower uh, calorie. Yeah. That's actually one staple or like one alternative that I eat yeah, all the time right? because yeah. it, it, they taste the exact same. And yeah. it's like, I'll just have a third taco. Yeah. That's amazing. And and like if you, <laughs> you know, if you're struggling with sweet cravings, diet soda. You know, not enough people I truly believe this. Not enough people are taking advantage of diet soda. That's another swap there we have keep. There's been so many messages of like diet soda, it's filled with chemicals, it's poisonous, <laughs> it's bad for you, it causes cancer. Let me let me get this very clear. Diet soda causes cancer in mice when they are fed such a high dose that it would not be physiologically possible for a human to get it. We would yeah. die of drowning before we could ever consume that dose. Even remotely close to that dose, we would die of drowning. Yeah. Dude, if you're, if you're drinking so much diet soda that you're, uh, you're, you're like close to dying of drowning, cool it. <laughs> so, calm right. down. Yeah. Yeah. It's so that's frustrating ludicrous because like <laughs> argument because diet soda can be so beneficial for people who drink soda. They get a lot of their calories from soda. They make this one easy swap. Like we have diet soda, even when I'm in a bulk, because I yeah. just like the taste of soda. It's just yeah. nice. Yeah, absolutely. We do, you know, when he's really into a bulk and he's got that really high calorie target, we do start, to... we start incorporating liquid calories yeah. because it's, a, I mean, it's a lot of yeah, food. Sometimes I do like like IBC root beer, which is just yeah. my favorite root beer. But yeah, it, it starts being a lot of food. And so it starts being hard for me to eat that much. But but yeah. yeah, I mean, even if you are in maintenance, I think swapping for diet soda is such a smart yes. thing. Because even if you're in maintenance, you know, your maintenance calories might not be super high depending on, you know, like the size of right. the person. So probably in the neighborhood of like most people, I would say, are probably in the neighborhood of like 1800 to 2300 for women and probably like 24 to 28 maybe even up to 3k for men yeah very dependent on the person sure. these are just like really rough ranges but like most people are between that 2000 to 3000 mark lower if you're a woman higher if you're a man simply because of like body weight and, yeah. and, and muscle mass to a degree yeah yeah
And the last thing I would just want to say on the diet food versus maintenance food kind of thing is that if your diet has a name, you're doing it wrong. You're yeah. fighting an uphill battle. If you're like, oh, I follow the keto pattern. I follow, uh, you know, the, oh, if you follow carnivore, <laughs> unsubscribe, <laughs> unsubscribe from this podcast. I'm kidding. You probably need to hear, listen to this podcast the most, but like. I can't imagine the grocery bill that someone on a carnivore diet oh, has to face. Dude, you need to eat fruits and veggies. Like <laughs> that, that too. Yeah, fiber, that's more important. Cutting than the- out fiber could be one of the, like intentionally cutting out fiber could be one of the dumbest. And I'm going to say probably the dumbest thing that you could possibly do for overall health. It That yeah. is the dumbest. I, I hesitate to say like one thing is the worst thing you can do. Cutting out fiber probably is the dumbest thing you could possibly do for overall healthy dietary patterns. Please yeah. do not ever do that. But yeah, if you're following any kind of diet that has a name, I don't know, man. If you really enjoy it, great. But like I, I'm a I firmly believe that people should be a little bit more flexible with their overall dietary patterns. Make it fit with yeah. that with specific occasions at specific times, specific lifestyles, specific habits. And you can tailor that and you can find There is no one optimal diet. That's the big thing. There is no one diet that is absolutely healthy. There are, thankfully, very thankfully, there are so many ways that we can achieve a very, very healthy diet with so much flexibility. You know, you might want to eat more plants. You might want to follow a vegetarian vegan diet and like, Okay, that I know that's technically a named diet. That's yeah, that's but like, a little I feel different. like that's a little bit different <laughs> than like that's those are like food choices rather than and, and that comes with like you know potentially ethical you know, uh, you yeah, know concerns. So that's like that's a little different. bit different than like saying like keto or carnivore or you know different things like that. But yeah, one other thing. This is a little bit like off topic, but kind of on on a similar vein of you know if your diet has a name, you're fighting an uphill battle. I feel like a lot of times when when you're really deep into these diets you start creating this like fear around different foods yeah. and that's another thing and like a, a, a degree of avoiding like tribalization. Yeah. I don't know if that's like a right word, but I find that, you know, just being on online in the nutrition world, like people get really, really dichotomous about food choices. If it doesn't align with specifically these self-imposed rules that they've mm-hmm. created just from following charlatans on on instagram you like that i did like that <laughs> you always whip out the new words it's like a different vocabulary when we're on the podcast it's fun <laughs> i i don't know yeah okay let's go to the next point we have mm-hmm. five left if you are seeing your current phase as a short-term fix rather than a lifestyle your dietary patterns your dietary decisions as a short-term fix rather than a lifestyle you're probably doing it wrong because <laughs> it is not if you have especially if you have a lot of weight to lose if you have like five pounds to lose yeah you're probably fine because it's, that means that you probably yeah. maintained your weight within like a pretty solid healthy range for a very long time you just want to lean out a little bit so yes then you can be a little bit, you know, then it is like a pretty short-term thing. But if you're somebody who struggled with weight your entire life, this is not a short-term thing anymore. This is not, this is not a, oh, I need to just cut my calories back and then I can go back to the way it was. That is, you need to change your entire lifestyle. You need to change. Maybe you need to move more. Maybe you need to go on daily WALKs. Maybe you need to start going to the gym more. Maybe you need to start, (laughs) you know, I'm talking about like the exercise side of things and I don't like talking about the exercise side of things for weight loss, but maybe you need to you know, start eating more fruits and veggies. Maybe you need to start, you know, eating more high volume foods, more satiating foods. Maybe you need to start cooking more at home and eating mm-hmm. out less. Maybe you need to start buying, there needs more leaner cuts of, of meat. There needs to be such a giant transformation in the way that you have been doing things. And I don't want this to sound like it's going to be this really difficult endeavor or anything like that, because it doesn't have to be right. one or two changes that feels sustainable might be all that you and your family need to end, you know, your or your family's struggles with being overweight or having, I should say having overweight or having obesity sounds a little weird to say having overweight, but sure. I don't like assigning. You're not an overweight person. You're a person who's struggling with overweight, Mm -hmm. you know, basically with being overweight. Okay. So, you know, it's just a labeling thing that matters to me. So, Yeah, you need to see this as a lifestyle and you need to think, okay, how can I change my eating behavior so that I can eat this way forever? Because let's say, you know, like I was saying earlier, if you go from like 200 to 150 pounds and your calorie needs drop along with that, then 
you know, you need to find a way to eat at that lower calorie target probably forever. And you need to find yeah. a way to make it not just like, oh, I can stick to this until I guess what happens at the end of it. There is no end. Right. There is no end. This is the way you're eating forever. So you need to tailor it to make sure that right. I can maintain this if, forever. Yes. If there was, if there were habits that you were in or lifestyle choices that you were making before that led to an outcome where you decided that I needed to adapt different habits. If you revert to those previous habits, where do you think the trajectory is going to yeah. go? Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't mean like, I hope that that comes across nicely. <laughs> no, I, no I, I think it comes across fine. Yeah. And I would also say like seeing it as a short-term fix. I love the analogy. If you are on the edge of a forest, you know, let's just close our eyes unless you're driving. If you're driving, keep your eyes open, please. <laughs> <laughs> but just try to imagine with your, with your third eye, if you will, you are on the edge of a forest. And when you look into the forest, you don't see an end to it. It is very, very deep. And you start walking and you walk for one hour straight into the forest. After one hour, you turn around, you're deep into the forest, you do 180 degrees, you start walking back, you walk on the same speed both ways. How long is it going to take you to get out? This is not a riddle. This is not a trick question. It will take you one hour. Mm -hmm. One hour in, one hour out. How long did it take you to, to gain the weight? Months? Probably not. Years? Maybe even decades, mm -hmm. probably. Years or decades, it took you to gain the weight. So why are you thinking that you can lose it in three weeks? Right. And get out of here. It's not going to happen. And if the, the, the faster you try to make this air quote fix, the harder it is going to be to maintain it. You need to tailor your habits. Think about the habits that you will have at the end of, you know, of all this. That's what you need to start doing now. Whatever it, you know, the, the, the means it takes to maintain it needs to be the means that you are achieving to lose it. Ready to move on? Yep. This kind of goes hand in hand with what we just said. Yeah, definitely. Not a adopting habits. Yeah. Yeah. Not adopting habits. So if you are, you know, again, just seeing this as like an acute thing where you are, you know, for the next six weeks, I'm going to go really hard and then I'm going to give it up. Nope. Yeah. Instead, let's try to find a middle ground. Instead of going like zero to 100, this all or nothing approach, let's try to find like, okay, what's the least that I can do that I could actually commit to for basically forever? Mm -hmm. Is it one workout per week? Is it two workouts per week? Is it eating out one time less per week? Mm -hmm. Is it switching from regular soda to diet soda? You know, what kind of habits can you, there are thousands of potential habits. Right. Maybe it's setting out your shoes the night before your, your workout clothes the night before. Maybe it's waking up and having a high protein breakfast. Maybe it's, there are so many things that you could do. Yeah. My favorite habit, just buy a dog, <laughs> just <laughs> not necessarily buy a dog. You can adopt a dog, <laughs> but, but adopt a dog and take them for WALK. Yeah. It's a great habit. Yeah. That's, that's a really great one. Or volunteer. If you, if you can't adopt a dog, Maybe go volunteer at the shelter. That's a really good one. And too. go go walk go walk a dog there. I mean, that's just like one that'll fill up your cup emotionally and physically. Yeah. Similarly, you know, on the topic of habits, we talk a lot about ones that you can adopt, but also like <laughs> on the flip side, kind of, is you don't want to be in this position where in order to lose the weight, you're doing these actions of like, oh, I've, I've eaten way over my calorie target. I'll just fast this mm, day. Yeah. You know, like that's not a sustainable practice or, oh, I haven't moved much. I haven't moved much. I'm going to run a 5k today right. to make up for it. Like those are not habits that we're telling you to adopt in order to create this lifestyle like those. So I think we also have to kind of mention the actual practices. You know, one thing that in terms of adopting a habit, Find a sport you enjoy. Mm -hmm. So many people think, okay, weight loss, got to go to the treadmill, mm -hmm. got to go run, got to go walk and walking and running. Those are great things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, are you, do you, do you, do you actually enjoy running? I think every, basically everybody kind of enjoys walking just at least like, sure. you don't Leisurely. hate it because it's yeah. just so chill, you know, it's so yeah. easy to do. 
But if you could find a sport that you enjoy, maybe a club in your, in your town or city that you could join, maybe it's, you know, whatever kind of thing it is. Pickleball is all the rage right now. Yeah. Played it just once, but it was, it was a really good time. Disc golf is Mm -hmm. great. You and I love doing that. We both, we have like a little hole outside of our house. If you're unfamiliar, it's like a basket with chains and you throw like a Frisbee into it. It's technically a disc, not a Frisbee, but they're pretty similar. Discs are just a little yeah. bit heavier. But yeah, you know, you go do those are disc golf is free at pretty much every location. You could download a disc, which is the an app, and you can see like a whole map. I'm sure there are for probably 98% of our listeners, there's probably a disc golf in their town, like a disc golf course in yeah. their town. Um, yeah, it's free to play. You just show up. You know, it's like just a little walk around a park. And very easy to get the hang of. Whereas like real golf, one, kind of expensive. Two, mm-hmm. very difficult. Very, very difficult. Yeah. Never done it, but yeah. yeah very difficult. Well, you, you played, you just been on the driving range with me. I've been to, yeah, I've been to the like driving top range. Golf. Yeah, I've done, done top, top golf. Yeah. Also, similarly, like group classes. Yeah. If you need like a socialization aspect too, it can Definitely. help get you out. Yeah. Those are, now, this actually kind of, the next point, actually, we almost sort of covered it, and that mm-hmm. was using cardio as a means to lose weight. Mm-hmm. Now, I think we will talk about this quite a bit more in our metabolic adaptation episode, but I do have a post on it from a while back. I don't know if you want to try to find it on my Instagram while I talk about it, but it's one of my most shared and liked posts of all time. And it's basically, here's why I don't love F45 and, and, and Orange Theory and other kind of like group and high intensity uh, classes, things like that for weight loss. And and the main reason is because there's a degree of metabolic adaptation where as we expend more energy from, it's quite a ways down, as we expend more energy from, from exercise, our body will downregulate the amount of energy we spend elsewhere. Here, you can use my phone to look it up. Yeah. Our body will expend more energy or um, less energy elsewhere. And so like, and that's a subconscious thing. And this also matters with intensity. So as intensity of an exercise goes up, we will have a greater degree of adaptation. And this is why walking can be a really, really just nice thing because it's so low intensity. There's probably less adaptation from it. So if you're using cardio as a means to lose weight, I instead would implore you to Sure, it will, you know, slightly benefit, you know, or increase your calorie expenditure, but I would rather instead have you use your training, you know, your exercise, your your cardio, your lifting weights to create physical adaptations in the body, you know, better cardio health and, you know, better, better strength, better mobility, better flexibility that comes with strength training, better, you know, improved aesthetics in terms of like, it depends on what you enjoy aesthetically, but yeah. Instead, please focus on your calorie intake. That is going to be, you know, weight loss really should be dictated in the kitchen if you want it to be as sustainable as possible. Now the post, Maddie just found it. July 25th, 2023. Okay. And very basically it, it starts with, it's a, it's a white text post and it's on my Instagram. It says, I don't love high intensity cardio for fat loss, things like orange theory, F45, et cetera. And then I, you know, it talks about this one study that the constrained energy model put forth by Herman Ponser in a study that he published in 2016. And it basically just says that if we expend energy through our exercise, our body will reduce energy expenditure throughout the day as a compensation for that exercise. And it it talks about, you know, intensity, and then it has some practical takeaways. So if you're interested, yeah, go check out that, uh, that post. Okay. We have two points left. The second to last point is emotional reactions to short-term fluctuations. And this is I'm about to say an F word, so earmuffs, the fuck it mentality. Yeah. This is, people get it when I say the fuck it mentality. They like, yeah. they're like, they have experienced it. When they see, you know, they're, uh, you know, just an example, weight 156, 155, 154, and it's going down. And then one day, 158. Yeah. And they think, mm, F it. Right. I'm done. Like I am, I'm done with this. It's not working for me. I, I hate this or worse if they weigh themselves only one day per week and it's like 154 and the next week is 156. Well, you only got one data point. You right. could be 153 the next day. You don't know. And so, but these short term, you know, these emotional reactions to short term fluctuations, they get people all the time. And I think women have a much harder time because of their period. Mm-hmm. They have this 
roughly four week cycle that just screws with them. And it is, that's a tougher hand to be dealt. It yeah. legitimately is a tougher hand. It doesn't, I'm not saying anything about like, oh, women aren't emotionally like, dude, if that happened to men, we'd be freaking out too. Right. We would not be Especially, happy either. I mean, some women, it can be a, it can be a pretty drastic, it can be a drastic thing. And so it's, it's wait, even okay. harder to see past those right. things. And I know women know like, yes, I'm going to be up, but it doesn't change that. It's, that's not easy to see Yeah, because they could be doing every single thing, right? They really truly could be in a deficit, but their weight, they're just hold on to more water mm -hmm. one week out of the month. And that's dude, 25% of the time. Come on. I, <laughs> Yeah. So I just have a lot of empathy and I hope that for the women listeners that you have a lot of empathy for yourself and you are just trying to look past that as much as possible. I know it is, it is more difficult and women are dealt a, a tougher hand. In addition to being like, you know, they, they burn less calories. Women typically burn less calories than men. So like they might have a boyfriend or husband and it's like, he just stops eating chips one night and he loses weight. Yeah. Like that's it. Like that's, yeah. that's basically it. He just is like, oh yeah, I'm going to try to lose weight. And he basically does nothing different. He just like gives up, you know, he drinks, he doesn't drink on Friday night anymore. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he's down five, 10 pounds and he looks amazing. And you're like, Whoa, dude, it feels yeah. like I'm doing everything. Or like when you get into a relationship and oh, suddenly yeah. like you're eating with another person and their yeah. eating style is so different. Like when yep. you and I first started dating. Oh, dude. There was like definitely like a seven, eight pound yeah. <laughs> weight jump yeah, before, because yeah. my eating habits were just completely different. You right. know, I'm, I'm now eating with someone who just has to naturally I eat, eat so much more. more. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, but, but, you know, try not to, you know, this is why I enjoy a lot of people don't like seeing the up and down of the daily weight, but I would actually say that is why I, I prefer it is because then you can just get a little bit more comfortable. It's like exposure therapy. You get a little bit more comfortable with these daily fluctuations. Yeah, your weight's going to go up. It's going to go down. It's going to go back up. That is the reality of it. It's like somebody who watches the stock market. You know, if we watch the stock market day by day, hour by hour, we're going to be like, oh my God, I'm winning. I'm so great. I'm, I'm amazing at this. And then an hour later, you're like, I suck at stocks. I suck at investing. I'm never going to do it again. The next hour, you're like, holy crap, I'm going to be a millionaire. If every hour keeps going like this for the next 38 hours, I'm cook. I'm cooking. We're yeah. good. I'm, uh, and then the next hour, it's like, I'm, I've lost everything. Yeah. I've lost it all. The other, F it. <laughs> the other thing is, you know, if you're, if you're weighing yourself at least four times a week up to every day, when you zoom out, you can see so much clearer yes. the actual decline of your calorie deficit, yeah. which is, I think, amazing. Like what happens if you only weigh yourself once a week and you – a couple weeks in a row, you always weigh in on like a, a high day, right. you know? Like yeah. suddenly, even if you are losing weight, you, suddenly your deficit looks a lot smaller than it is and it's like – I really thought I was, you know, maintaining at this, but my weight chart doesn't show that. Right. And it's like, well, if you weighed yourself a couple more times, you'd probably get. Yeah. So you'd get clearer data. Yeah. yeah I a hundred percent agree. So it, it's tough at first, especially if you're not used to weighing yourself and you have that emotional reaction to the scale. However, if you're able to kind of work past that, I do think it is overall more mentally beneficial Definitely. to but like dude you might have a more stressful day you might have a hard workout in the gym so you're holding on a little bit more water you might have maybe you ran a lot the day before and so you're kind of empty on glycogen and you're mm -hmm. maybe you're dehydrated so your weight is down and the next day you eat a little bit more glycogen or more carbs your glycogen is up your stomach content is up your water is up your you know and then you're up three pounds and you're like if you, <laughs> you need to look past this because yeah. the body weight the, the or the scale will never perfectly represent your body weight because it is not you are more than, than just body fat. Right. You, so like, it's not, you're <laughs> never going to be able to tell body fat based on right. the scale fluctuations. And it, it's just, it's, it's, you're, you're wasting mental energy by getting upset about it. Yeah. And it's really similar. You know, I say, if you're in maintenance, give yourself a range of like, this is my maintained weight. You know, if I'm, within five pounds or whatever arbitrary number you use, I've maintained my weight. It's really similar for a calorie deficit. Like yeah. you kind of have this range of like those, that's a fluctuation. I agree. Yeah. Okay. And our last point, and we kind of touched on this a little bit, but lack of family slash social support. Mm -hmm. If your family, whether you're a husband, a wife, you know, you are, maybe you're just a teenager or young adult listening to this, in which case, please use your muffs next time. So you don't hear me swear. <laughs> yeah. But like whoever you are, you know, wherever you're living, whatever your household situation is like, you know, you got a girlfriend, a boyfriend, you got a situation ship, you got, you know, husband, wife, whatever it is, if they are not on the same page as you, it that's tough. 
Yeah. So you need to communicate, like have a legitimate, if you know, if you're in a relationship and you actually like, you know, it's not just a situationship, love that term. You need to have a real conversation of like, Hey, I have these goals mm -hmm. and it would be very helpful if we were on the same page. I don't expect you to maybe have the same goals as me, yeah. but here's how you could support me through my goals. You know, yeah. maybe the person you're with doesn't want to lose weight, but you do. If you are not on the same page and they want to eat out every night and you're like, Hey, I just want to eat like a little bit of broccoli tonight. <laughs> not literally just broccoli, right. but you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like I, yeah. I want to eat a veggie, you know, in addition <laughs> to like, you know, can we just not eat fast food like tonight, please? And the other person's like, Oh, but I really want a pizza. Or I really wanted, you know, Taco Bell, mm -hmm. McDonald's, whatever it is, you know, some kind of fast food or whatever takeout. It's going to be really, really, really difficult. Yeah. And it's not just from not just from the perspective of like food, but it's also from the perspective of exercise. If you have somebody that is supportive and is like, Hey, you know, you want to go on a, you want to go on a WALK with me? Mm -hmm. Like for the person who's losing weight, if you have, you know, we've been talking about the perspective of somebody who's trying to lose weight. Let's talk about the perspective of somebody who's supporting somebody who wants to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Wow. If you could be like, I, I had a member in Ford forever say that her husband started he was, he was like the cook in their family. Like mm -hmm. he, he's just really likes cooking. And so he always does that. Um, his wife who was a member of Ford forever had, you know, just kind of communicated to him like, Hey, I'm doing this program, you know, obviously. And he was like, okay, well, what can I do to support you? First off. So sweet. That's so kind. <laughs> that's like so that's sweet. such a nice thing. And then as he was cooking, he started tracking it all mm -hmm. in the calorie tracker and would give her the macros and be like, here you go. Here's, here's everything that, you know, you're eating. Here's your serving size. Like, that's just such a nice thing to do. Yeah. And so, you know, you don't have to go like that far into it necessarily, sure. but if you could just be like, Hey, what would be like a good, you know, what could I grocery shop for? What could I, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of meals are we looking at? Or like, how, you know, how can I best support you? Do we need to get some adjustable dumbbells at home? Do we, you know, maybe we do like a nightly WALK, you know, there's so many ways that you can support your partner through their you know, fitness and health goals. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's a really important thing is like weight loss is oftentimes, you know, it depends on the situation and all that, but weight loss is oft, oftentimes not just an aesthetic thing. It's, it's often usually a health thing too. Yeah. So if you want your partner to be healthy and you want them to live for a long time and they are currently overweight, you could have a hand in extending their lifespan or at least their healthy living years. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we have medicine now that can kind of keep us alive for a really long time. Yeah. But in terms of the, you know, reduce your risk of heart attack, reduce your risk of stroke, reduce your risk of, of diabetes. And like, you're going to be, you, you either, you know, you pay for it now or you pay for it later. Mm -hmm. You know, you pay for it now with time and effort in the, in the gym and in the kitchen, or you pay for it later in, in ways that for people who have seen what a stroke or what a heart attack can do to a, a person, whether it is a parent or whether it is a, a you know family member, a loved one, whatever it is, like, it's not fun. Mm -hmm. It's not pretty, you know? And if you can reduce your risk of that just by simple stuff, you know, get your calories into a better spot, get your, get your weight into a better spot, get your body composition into a better spot. You know, and it only takes a little bit of support to really have life changing outcomes. And so if you are lacking the family and social support, you a need to be the role model for everybody else in your family. And B, you need to be a cheerleader who anybody, for anybody else who jumps on the, the train or the bandwagon later, because if, if you can set the example and then you can kind of be the cheerleader for them, like I am for you to a degree, you know, you have healthy eating patterns, but you would not step foot into a gym. No basically no. ever if it wasn't for me no no but but <laughs> no, i go out to my, the gym yesterday yeah. and and you say okay i guess i'll come out and do a little bit of a little bit of cardio i'm like great amazing yeah you know and then you got done with your like 15 20 minute bike ride and i was like how about you just do like two exercises with me and you're like yeah. ah, all right fine yeah yeah similarly i also want to mention like on this lack of family and social support you and your partner do not have to be in the same, like you don't have to have the same goals. You don't have to be in the no. same like phase. You know, there are definitely times when Alex is cutting that I am not, <laughs> I am not cutting one for as long or two as drastic yeah. <laughs> as he is because we just, we have different goals. I'm so intense in, about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And also like 
let's be real, it's part of your job. You know, it, like, yes, like yes. there's definitely a, a, a job aspect. Component. Yeah, that, this is like, I have to be <laughs> um, professional. Yeah. Or like now, you know, the early days of my pregnancy, you were still cutting. Yep. So I, you know, I don't want you to hear this and think like, oh, we have to have the exact same goals. It'll just be easier. Sure, it might be a little easier. Sure. But health promoting behaviors are across the board. Yeah. And they can exist regardless of like a, an intentional weight loss yeah. phase. It can yeah. exist on a spectrum of like how intense, how much do you want to turn this dial up on intensity of with your nutrition, with your fitness, with, you know, your cardio and your lifting, you know, side of fitness. And so just because you guys are not on the same, you know, degree of intensity, right. you're not turning up the dial as much, or you're not turning up the dial more that, that doesn't, you know, that, that does not change like health promoting behaviors are mm -hmm. very similar across the board. Yeah. And you, you know, if you are on this journey, you could be a catalyst for the people around you to start making choices that are maybe, maybe a good option for them. You started off that sentence so strong. I was I, like, keep I going. Did, I, I got a little nervous of like what I was going to say, because I don't want to say that like everyone needs to be doing X, Y, Z. Like that wasn't my intention. No, you said, <laughs> you said you could be a catalyst for, I was like, mm, you spin. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I don't want you to hear that and think like, oh, well they have to track their calories or they no. have to be on a weight loss. So I, I started getting a little bit like, mm, let me, let me reel that back in. <laughs> yeah, no. I, and then that's actually a really good point is you don't have to like, let's say person A is tracking their calories and their husband or wife is not tracking their calories. Like that's yeah. totally okay. Right. One person, I mean, for the last two and a half years, I've tracked my calories 91, 90.8% 90 of days. Yeah. And I've maybe done 12%. 12%? <laughs> last two and a half years. No that's, way. That's, that's, that's too generous. high. That's generous. Yeah. 5%. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> you also have just like a really good idea of, portion sizing and like calories, like you, we, we did this thing for a long time where Maddie would guess the number of calories of oh, like yeah. on a plate and she would be within like <laughs> literally within like 25 calories, which is psychotic. Most people are not that good at yeah. uh, guessing. I think there was this one study that I was reading the other day. Um, I'm going to get the details a little bit fuzzy, but mm -hmm. they tested like general public and then even registered dietitians on their capability of estimating calories. And I think the average, even for registered dietitians was 20% under estimation. So 20% wow. is pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why it's a weird skill that it's I have. It's a weird <laughs> skill. It's a, but even just like having some degree of awareness of like, Definitely. ah, that's probably about, you know, 20, 30, 40 grams of protein or eh, it's maybe like five grams of fiber. Eh, maybe that's like 500 calories. As long as you're not like, oh, that's 500 calories and it's actually 1200. Like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now we're, we want to be in the right ballpark. Be in somewhat of a ballpark. Okay. I feel like we nailed it all. Is there anything else that you want to cover? I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I don't think so. I think we covered everything. Awesome. All right. Well then everybody, this serves as the outro. Thank you so much for listening to episode 10. We're really excited to make it into the double digits. Once again, please give us a five-star rating, like, share, subscribe, whatever you got to do. We really appreciate it. Screenshot and share it on your Instagram story and tag us at me at, whoop, at Alex TV fitness and <laughs> at meals with Maddie <laughs> and consider joining the A team or forward forever. You don't have to join both because the workout programs are the same. They're just buffered by one week, but they're, they're the same. The A team is seven day free trial and there it's less than a dollar a day and forward forever the next cycle starts registration begins on march 24th and we begin on april 1st okay that was a very fun episode thank you for listening and we hope to see you for episode 11 take care